have something very, very natural. These are the currents that have been at work yeah. for many, many thousands of years. Okay. So that if someone that left in a boat from North Africa, all they would have to do is click into something called the Canary cur Current, named after the Canary Islands, which are out here. And you follow straight across, and this will take you right into the Americas. And then when you want to go back, you just follow the Gulf Stream and take you right on out again like that. Now, most archaeologists today, they say this is a lot of nonsense. They said, most archaeologists say, oh, ancient people in those days, they didn't have the means to get over here. They were too afraid of the ocean. They only would go out on boats to do fishing and so on, you know. But what that means is, is that the archaeologists are too afraid to go out in the ocean, is what they're saying here. You know, it's not the ancient people. Uh, the, uh, the archaeologists are, will only get into a little boat. They're not going to go out. But can you imagine a people that lived in that kind of hard warfare in those days, or people that made the great pyramids, that they'd be too stupid or too cowardly to get into a boat to come over here? I don't, don't agree with that. Now, here's an idea, you know, the type of ships that are still being made. These are small boats. These are reed boats that are made in uh, Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. Uh, or hired out uh, about 15 years ago, more than that, 20 years ago. It took a boat very similar to this, made in the same essential construction, and sailed from North Africa directly into uh, Veracruz in the Gulf of Mexico. They, they can't even be sunk. <laughs> now, they, so the archaeologists say, oh, okay, you've got a theory, but do you have any proof at all? There's no, no proof of any of this. Well, here's a stone that was found at the bottom of a lake, believe it or not, in Wisconsin. Now, it's unusual because it was found in what appeared to be the remains of a building underwater, about 20 feet underwater. So it's been there a long time. All the stones connected with this building were round. This one was wedge-shaped. You will see, very basically out here, the outlines of a ship. Now, this is a wedge-shaped stone that was indented, first of all. Here you see part of the bow, and here's a sail. And I'll show you a better example of it. This is a cylinder seal. This is a cylinder seal. It comes from ancient Syria. It's dated to about 900 B.C. And it shows basically the hull, and it shows the type of sail they used, and it shows also the type of figureheads. Now keep that image in mind while I show you that same stone under different light. You see? There it is. There's the sail. Same thing. So someone had carved this. It's not a fake because it was found, like I said, underneath the water. water. I'm sorry, excuse me. This is top part of the type of technology used to bring these ancient people across the sea. Now the Egyptians, they talked about also a great flood. And this is part of their temple artwork which shows the gods and the early human beings leaving this island, which they called Alalu or the Isle of Reeds, the Island of Reeds. Now that's interesting because over here, the Aztecs spoke about their ancestors coming from a place called Atslan. And Atslan means place of reeds, exactly the same thing. And there is Atslan. This is the Mexican story of their migration. They came from a great island, a great volcanic island in the sea. This represents Mexico. And this is the glyph meaning one, or beginning. Everything starts. The Aztecs also had something known as a calendar stone. This calendar stone, excuse me, is not just a calendar to tell what month it is or what day it is. This was built on the cycles of time. It said that before our age, where we are now, there were four previous ages and in these ages human beings achieved great things they had yeah. happy societies and they thought they were it until they began to stray from the laws of nature right. and when they did that their societies declined and whenever the societies declined for a long period of time the earth always rebelled something happened yeah. so they said now in the earliest times uh, the earliest fall of men was because of animals. They got out of harmony with animals, and the animals destroyed most men. And then God took pity on the few survivors and says, okay, I'll give you a chance again, and they start all over again. And then other things came along, wind, hurricane. But interestingly enough, 
These are the Aztecs now. These are not the American Indians or the Greeks. They said that the last big destruction was by a great deluge, huge flood, destroyed everything. That's the land. Because those people also were virtuous but lost them because they got greedy. I'll show you a close-up of that. I'll show you what that represents. This is a close-up of, of the last age, according to the Aztecs. And it shows you here a pyramid. You're looking down on the pyramid. This is like you're looking from, from the sky, from God's point of view. Looking down on a pyramid. And here you see a bucket overturned with water coming out of the sea. So it's the same, you've got the same theme repeated over and over again. And now this calendar stone is a very remarkable device. It's, it still works. For example, this calendar stone told the Aztecs exactly when they would be conquered. They told them the exact year when they would be overcome by Cortez. Modern Indians in Mexico and in the Southwest use this stone today, images of it, to say when the next destruction will come. The next destruction is supposed to come in the early part of the next century. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it will come, but if society continues to go along the way it goes now, it will. We still have time to re... But if, if society continues to decline, like all these other previous times, then we will also be rebelled against by the earth. And when you consider, for example, all the ecological disasters in the making, uh, how the earth has been sinned against, and all the warnings that we're getting from Amen. science. Amen. This does not sound all that uh, superstitious. Question. Uh, Frank, question. Yeah. You're talking about traveling by a boat. Do you realize that those people thousands of years ago traveled by air? That's a whole different... Uh, it's hey, another hey, lecture. <laughs> you're, so you're aware of Yeah, I am, but uh, I can't keep these people that long. That, that's, that sounds like a lecture you should give. Now, this is just a, a story, a recreation again of the, of the flood. And this is how the, the people that built that stone envisioned the last destruction. Now, yes? Okay. This goes back uh, basically to the time of Atlantis again, about 1200 BC. Uh, this area goes back to about 3000 BC, 3000 before Christ. Then, then these, these are, I explained basically how this stone works. It's, it's a sophisticated, complex computer. Whoever made this or put this together represented a genius of an extremely high mathematical level. And I do not pretend to understand it all. I, I've read as much as I can about it, but it takes someone of a far greater mathematical comprehension than myself to understand. Basically, let me explain this. This is not a stone that you pick up and hold. This is, is a kind of a bowl. These are different, how do I put it, plates which you can turn and shift and they will line up so you can compute things. You can turn this, you can turn this, this section, this section, the outer section, they all are like concentric rings. They turn so you can calculate how far back you can go, maybe millions of years, maybe millions of years. I know this goes back to 3000 BC. I don't know how far back that goes. Okay, there's an old saying that every 25,000 years the wise scientists get together to compute the history for the next 25,000 years. Is this what they use to compute it with? I don't know, but I, I'm not a wise man. I can't tell you. This is, this is a recreation. This is what the original looked like, okay? Now, the original was a fabulous terrible thing. Now let me explain what I mean by that. In the center here you see this representation of the sun. He has his tongue sticking out. He has human hearts on his tongue. His two talons here are grasping human hearts. This rep these people, the Aztecs, they worshipped the god of time. The supreme god. Because, what does time do? Time brings everything together. Time destroys everything. And time brings it back. Now this is a representation of time in his awful aspect because he, look at what he's surrounded by. He's surrounded by these destructions that wiped out human, human beings, wiped out humanity. The great flood, uh, some other disaster that goes all the way back thousands or millions of years. So what this is saying is saying, watch out. He's saying, look out. Get, get your society together or else you're going to go down. 
So that's why he's represented like that. Get your horse in order, right? Oh, I'm sorry, the original. Okay, the original. Okay, this is a reproduction. The original is in the um, what do they call the Archaeological Museum of Mexico City. It is a stone that is about 12 feet high. It weighs 21 tons. It was placed in a great. It was placed in a great cradle. And 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 this cradle was at the top of a pyramid in uh, Teotihuacan. I'm sorry, Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan was the great uh, empire capital of the Aztecs. Now, when the Spaniards came in, they saw this, and they were thought these people were worshiping the devil. So they did not understand the concept of time. So the Spaniards came in, they ripped it out of its cradle, and they sent it careening down the stairs of the pyramid. It got all chipped up and banged up. And then they buried it. Well, when Mexico, modern Mexico City was being made, the construction engineers found this. They excavated it, and it is now in the museum. Archaeologists over time were able to find traces of paint and were able to reconstruct the lost parts. So this, I didn't want to show you the one that's in the museum today because it just looks like a wreck, and you can understand it, but this highlights all of those details that I was yeah. telling you about. This is what it looked like. It was a beautiful, yeah. terrible thing. It, it overhung the whole city, and so that the Aztecs would go by every day, and they would, the people that lived in Tenochtitlan, they would see, we have got to act harmonious or else that's the only way we can avoid coming disasters. So that uh, they would try to figure out exactly. the stargates. That movie, movie stargates. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly. Yeah. In fact, it's based on astral technology. Yes. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm almost finished here. Now, uh, this is a representation. <laughs> This was a representation that was found in Guatemala. Uh, I visited a place called Tikal, which is a jungle Tikal city. Tikal fought with Washeka tombs, and Washeka tombs fought with Tikal. They're the same you have now as the Washington tombs. Go ahead! All right, she knows. She knows, that's it. But on the side of this building called the Acropolis, as the archaeologists call it, uh, next to the pyramid, not on the pyramid. There was a, a frieze, a stone representation along the roof. And this is one of the representations. It shows a man in a boat rowing away, somebody drowning in the water, and in the background is a volcano exploding, see? And here's a representation of a building falling into the sea. So here's the same story. We're finding North America, ancient Greece, Mexico, now we're down to Guatemala. All these ancient frieze European traditions are yes. talking about a major big disaster from this previous society that came to the New World. Well, we have no idea what they refer to this as because this comes from uh, the early Mayas and very little uh, of their uh, translatable material is available until very recently. Actually, now they've broken a lot of the Maya hieroglyphs. So there, maybe we'll, we will find out the name of what that volcano was. The Aztecs referred to it as Atslan. Atlantis. <laughs> Atlantis also. Vulcan. Vulcan? Uh, yeah, the Romans would call it Vulcan also. Yeah, that's another word. Now, this is just a sort of an idealized representation of what this previous homeland looked like. It was very mountainous. It's a place of uh, great splendor and wealth. Uh, these are the canals that would service all parts of the island. Now, where... Where do we think that this land of Atlantis was? Here is Spain, Portugal, Gibraltar, Morocco, North Africa, the Canary Islands, Madeira, the Azores. It appeared, from what Plato tells us, Atlantis was this large island just outside, outside the Straits of Gibraltar. He referred to them as the Pillars of Hercules in those days. That's this area. So it would be in this area. Well, what do we find? This is what, if you're in a satellite today or a space shuttle, you look down, this is what it looks like. But what does it look like under the water? Is there anything under there? Isn't that a common uh, uh, Egyptian? <laughs> it looks almost like it. Well, here's that same area of ocean. 
This is a map now, of course. This is underwater. This is a very recent map that was released by Scripps Howard Oceanographer Society oh, about two years ago. It shows really what's at the bottom of the ocean. This has only been learned through space satellite technology. Here we see the Canary Islands. Here's North Africa. Here's Portugal and Spain. And right over here, we find something called Mount Ampere. That's a name that's given to it by geologists and oceanographers. And it is a large sunken island. Now when a ship called the Glomar Challenger went out to this area to investigate it, they found that in fact it is a large volcano which sank, collapsed into the ocean within the last 10,000 years. So most likely this is the real Atlantis. This is the homeland of mankind. Yeah. Now, this is a drawing that's based on Plato's description of Atlantis. Concentric circles. You see here is the central Holy of Holies, the main temple. These are the water courses and land courses that would connect all parts of the island. This is as it's shown as it's being built. This would be sort of an idealized representation of the center of Atlantis. To give you an idea again what it was like. On the land were all the great temples, all the magnificent buildings. Here was the great administrative center and the, the temple of Poseidon, where also the sun and the sea were worshipped. Again, sacred harmony, five and six. Yeah. Now, it was of course struck by a major volcanic event. That area of the ocean that I showed you is very seismically active. In its last days, Atlantis is being overwhelmed by this volcanic activity. How possibly then it sink? We think we understand the mechanism. This would be the people evacuating the city as it's being uh, tormented by the uh, volcanic eruption. And here is a representation of the great city tragically being overwhelmed by walls of water. Yeah. Now we think, how, how did this happen? How could just a volcanic eruption actually sink an island? Well, imagine when Mount St. Helens exploded. Now, what happened? Did, remember 1980, Mount St. Helens exploded in, in Washington, the state of Washington. And it didn't blow straight up, did it? It blew out the side. So if Mount St. Helens had been an island surrounded by water, and would have blown out the side. The water would have rushed in to something called the magma chamber. That would have then caused something called subduction. It would have literally grabbed or pulled the entire island under underwater. And that's basically what probably happened there. All right. So in its last days, there would be been nothing left but this great cataclysm from which a few people survived. Yeah, now here we are in Poverty Point. This is a recreation of one of the mounds there that was found. Now here is an aerial photograph, one of the earliest aerial photographs of Poverty Point. And it shows again the same setup that you see in Atlantis. You have the alternating rings of land and water. These indentations were found all to be water channels. This is overgrown area. At first it was thought this is only the city itself. But subsequent investigation with infrared photography has shown that these rings extend all around, so that this river really cut through it. <coughs> At the very center was their temple, their Holy of Holies also, the same as described by Plato. Here is a cutaway, an archaeologist's cutaway of Poverty Point. You, you see to better advantage. Now what's interesting, this mound is an artificial mound that was also built by the ancient people here. And it is just due north of Poverty Point. You go visit that today. Interestingly enough, Plato said that the city of Atlantis lay just due south of a great sacred mountain. So here we see here the attempts by these people here to recreate their sacred mountain. This again idea, this is a drawing of Plato's a description of Atlantis, same circular configuration that you see in Poverty Point. Here's a, this is taken of a model that's uh, at the museum. This is another example again of Atlantis as a concentric design. By the way, this is an extremely unusual design. You do not see cities laid out like this anywhere. It's usually laid out on a grid system. So to find something like this occurring in two different parts of the world surely indicates a connection of some kind. 
this again to go back. Here we are, Atlantis. Here we are, Poverty Point. And again, keep in mind that the dates also coincide. Poverty Point is built 1200 BC. Atlantis is destroyed 1200 BC. Okay, Frank, you're saying yeah. that uh, Atlantis was the patriarch of the civilization. What about the moon? That's a, again, these are really huge topics to get into. Uh, I would kind of the have to divert from one. But, uh, How old Moo? Moo is uh, another one to get into. I... So then if you're from a, a distance, this is what it would have looked like. Oh, am I going the right way here? Oh, I'm sorry here. So this is just the, the gift of the past that I think is being shared with all of us. And I, I really sincerely appreciate your efforts to, to do uh, this honoring of the past. And it's really the important thing. And if you'd like to, to help us out, the best way is to subscribe to our magazine and tell your friends about it. And right. we're, we're trying to carry on these ideas. Nobody else that I know of is dedicated to these same <laughs> principles no of bringing out the past. So uh, that's no why I, I really no appreciate the chance to be able to speak with you today. And, uh, and thank you very much. Yeah, for your <laughs>